For more than two decades, the Colorado River's story was one of relentless decline, shrinking water, cracked earth, and mounting alarm. The river, once a symbol of abundance and life for the American Southwest, became a stark warning of what climate change and overuse could bring. Scientists warned of a future defined by shortages and conflict, as the river supplying 40 million people seemed to be drying up. Communities braced for water restrictions, farmers faced tough choices, and cities scrambled to secure their futures. Then, between 2022 and 2024, something astonishing happened. The river rebounded and fast. Water levels that had been falling for years suddenly surged, catching nearly everyone off guard. Reservoirs surged, models were upended, and experts were left scrambling to explain the dramatic turnaround. Headlines celebrated the unexpected recovery, while researchers rushed to understand what had changed. This wasn't a miracle but a result of rare wet winters and bold human intervention. Unusually heavy snowpack in the Rocky Mountains, combined with coordinated water management, brought new hope to the region. The speed of recovery stunned everyone, showing that even in the face of long-term climate trends, short-term weather and decisive action can make a huge difference. Fields that had been brown and brittle turned green again, and the river's flow returned with a force few had dared to imagine. The river's comeback offered a brief window of hope and a reminder of nature's unpredictability. Families gathered by the water's edge, celebrating a return many thought impossible. For scientists, it was a humbling lesson. Our models are only as good as the data and assumptions behind them. The river's rapid recovery forced a re-examination of long-held beliefs about drought, resilience, and the limits of prediction. The Colorado River's surprise recovery proved that, sometimes, nature still has the power to astonish. Wildlife returned to the riverbanks, and ecosystems began to heal, if only for a moment. But this reprieve is fragile, and the underlying challenges remain. The scars of drought are still visible, and the threat of future shortages continues to loom over the region. The question now, can we turn this surprise into lasting change? Will communities, scientists, and leaders work together to build a more resilient future for the Colorado River? Or will this moment of hope fade as quickly as it arrived? To truly understand the Colorado River's dramatic turnaround, we need to look closely at its two giants, Lake Powell and Lake Mead. These massive reservoirs are not just engineering marvels. They are the beating heart of water storage and supply for the entire American Southwest. By 2022, both reservoirs had plummeted to historic lows. The stark white bathtub rings etched into the canyon walls told a story of years of drought and overuse. Cities, farms, and millions of people who depend on this water watched anxiously as the levels dropped lower and lower, wondering how much further they could fall. Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the country, was teetering on the edge of dead pool status, a point where water could no longer flow downstream, threatening not just water supplies but also hydroelectric power for millions across the region. Then, in a remarkable turn of events, both lakes surged back. Over just two years, Lake Powell rose by 50 feet and Lake Mead climbed nearly 20. It was a dramatic reversal, fueled by a combination of heavy snowfall, strategic water management, and a bit of luck. The immediate crisis eased, and for a moment relief swept through the region. But the volatility of the system was undeniable. These reservoirs can swing from disaster to recovery in a flash, reminding us how fragile this balance truly is. This rebound bought us precious time but it didn't solve the underlying issue. We are still using more water than the river can sustainably provide, and every drop is spoken for by cities, farms, and ecosystems. The partial refill of these reservoirs is both a relief and a stark warning. It shows that nature can surprise us, but also that we can't count on luck alone. The long-term imbalance, where demand continues to outpace supply, remains the central challenge for everyone who relies on the Colorado River. The future of the American West depends on how we use this brief window of stability. Communities, policymakers, and individuals all have a role to play in shaping what comes next. The lesson is clear. Resilience is possible but only if we act decisively and prepare before the next inevitable drought arrives. The fate of the river and of everyone who depends on it is still in our hands. Our choices now will echo for generations. The question remains, will we use this time wisely or let history repeat itself? What sparked the river's comeback? Two forces, nature's generosity and human resolve. First, back-to-back -back winters brought heavy snow to the Rockies, sending a surge of meltwater downstream. This natural boost was crucial, but luck alone wasn't enough. 
At the same time, states like Arizona, California, and Nevada launched unprecedented water-saving efforts. Federal funding paid farmers to fallow fields and cities to upgrade infrastructure, saving over 1.6 million acre-feet of water. These actions kept more water in the reservoirs, amplifying the impact of the wet years. The result? A rare alignment of weather and policy that refilled the system. But wet winters aren't guaranteed, conservation is our best bet for the future. The recovery proved we have the tools to manage the river more sustainably. The challenge? Will we keep using them when the crisis fades? The river's future depends on our answer. The river's recovery hasn't solved its biggest political problem. Who gets the water? The century-old rules expire in 2026, forcing seven states into tense renegotiations. The upper basin wants cuts based on actual river flow. The lower basin wants to protect historic shares. The gap between proposals is vast, and the stakes couldn't be higher. The federal government is pushing for compromise but time is running out. If the states can't agree, Washington may impose its own plan, nobody's first choice. The recent rise in reservoirs has made talks harder, as urgency fades and old rivalries return. The outcome will shape the West's cities, farms, and environment for decades. The clock is ticking on the Colorado's next chapter. When it comes to water use, agriculture is the real giant, by far the thirstiest sector drawing from the Colorado River. While cities and towns often get the spotlight in water debates, it's the vast fields of crops that truly dominate the river's flow. Especially cattle feed crops like alfalfa and hay, which require enormous amounts of water to thrive in the arid west. These fields stretch for miles, soaking up precious river water day after day. Nearly half the river's water goes to growing feed for livestock, a staggering share that shapes the landscape and economy of the region. Much of this water is used in California's Imperial Valley, a place where green fields meet desert thanks to the river's lifeblood. Some of this hay doesn't even stay in the U.S. It's packed up and shipped overseas to feed cattle in distant countries, meaning we're essentially exporting our water embedded in every bale to places as far away as Asia and the Middle East. This single use of water for agriculture dwarfs all the water used by cities combined, by a huge margin. Urban water use, even with lawns and parks, is just a fraction of the total. Yet, the debate over water cuts often targets urban lawns and household use, sparking frustration and confusion among city dwellers. But the biggest potential savings lie in agriculture. Many farmers are already adapting, switching to efficient drip irrigation, planting less thirsty crops, and experimenting with new technology to stretch every drop. Some are even fallowing land for compensation, leaving fields unplanted to save water. These changes aren't easy, they mean tough choices and economic risk, but they're essential for the river's future. The math is clear, without addressing agriculture's massive water use, lasting solutions will remain out of reach. Supporting farmers through this transition is key, helping them invest in new systems, adapt to changing markets, and keep rural communities strong. Rural communities depend on agriculture, and their future is tied to the river's fate collaboration and innovation will be crucial. The path forward must balance food production with water reality, finding ways to grow what we need while protecting the river that sustains us all. Only then can the Colorado continue to nourish both farms and cities, securing a future for everyone who depends on its waters. For a century, tribal nations were excluded from Colorado River decisions, despite holding senior water rights. That's finally changing. Tribes are now at the negotiating table, shaping the river's future. Their participation isn't just fair, it's essential for legal and practical reasons. As tribes assert their rights, the water math for everyone else shifts. Tribal perspectives bring a deeper focus on long-term stewardship and ecological health. This overdue inclusion enriches the conversation and strengthens the search for solutions. The river's future must reflect all who depend on it. A more just and resilient era is beginning. The Colorado River's fate isn't just decided in boardrooms, it's shaped by what's on our plates. High demand for beef and dairy drives massive water use for cattle feed. If Americans reduced red meat consumption to recommended levels, the water savings would be huge. Small dietary shifts can ripple all the way back to the river, but personal choices alone aren't enough. Policy and collective action, smarter water use, better technology and fairer rules are essential. The recent recovery bought us time, but not a guarantee. The next chapter depends on whether we seize this moment to build a sustainable future. The Colorado River has surprised us before. Now, it's our turn to rise to the challenge.